happened in the 90s. This is Steve G, Matt G with Happened in the 90s, a show where we talk about things that happened in the 90s. So get out your Blockbuster memberships and your six pack of Surge because we have a very special guest, uh, PTO. And we're not talking about paid time off. This man doesn't take any days off. Uh, he's probably the hardest working man in 90s showbiz, not named Samuel Jackson. He's none <laughs> other than Patrick. Thomas O'Brien! Yeah. Patrick, thank you so much for being here, sir. Oh, and Mr. Dewey would say, settle down. <laughs> you got it, Steve. I love it. Well, first of all, Patrick, we were talking, you actually, you know, we're going to probably cover a lot more than this, but just to get into it, you're looking, you moved away from L.A. Yeah, 14 years ago, almost, yeah. I got to say, I feel like maybe you, you did the right thing. It's looking really good for you right now. I'd wait a no, little bit. No. Both, both my wife and I, soon after we moved, realized it was a mistake. But uh, here we are. And uh, But I am looking to move back, by the well, way, to L.A. When you get back. I got a 16-year-old. We have older kids who are in their 30s. But a 16-year-old, and once he's out of school, we're trying to yeah, to push him toward going to school in Southern California and uh, and move back, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Well, hey, one of our daughters is in San Diego, so uh, so it would work out if we could get some of the family moved back there. Be great. I mean, it's the way you can't beat the weather. I'm sure in Wisconsin, it's uh, you know, uh, a little Minnesota bit actually, but close enough. Yeah, yeah, that's where I grew up, Wisconsin. But uh, yeah, February sucks. By how how blue can we get here? By the way, with uh, language uh oh you can oh. go feel free if you want right. to occur go ahead and curse if you want to no worries all right it'll, it'll happen probably hey love to yeah. hear well california Thanks. misses you and uh you know i wanted to just ask just we're, we're 90 centric podcast patrick so i don't know if steve has any questions that he wants to intro with but uh steve do you have anything you want to start with before I get oh. into what I was going to ask, well, well, just go go ahead. What were you going to ask? Well, Patrick, you know, as somebody, we could go through your resume. You've been a working actor in Hollywood for decades. You're still working. You're, I mean, you've had an awesome career, and especially in the '90s, it seems like everything that I grew up on, you were in. So you've, I've seen articles say this, you were, you've been that guy. I know that guy. Yeah. A lot of hey, shows. it's that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you enjoy, like, there's people that talk about being too famous or not famous enough. Do you enjoy this, this section of Hollywood that you've, uh, you've populated for so long? Is this, is the dream coming true? Uh, of course. You know, of course. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, I think I think I kind of hit the sweet spot there. I mean, yeah, people, yeah, kind of recognize me. Yeah, you're that guy, which is cool. I, I love it every time it happens, but it's not so. It's not overbearing, you know. I mean, I remember doing a job with uh, 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 Al Bundy. Um, uh, 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 um, Neil. Neil. Uh, what's his first name? Ed O'Neill. Bad names. Ed. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Ed O'Neill, and and he was complaining that God everywhere he went, you know, he he told me about he was skiing in Switzerland, and people were coming up to him, bugging him, you know, asking for autographs. And so, but no, with with my level of fame, you know, I think it's 
it, it's cool when it happened. It doesn't happen hardly at all anymore when people recognize me, but when it did, it was, it was always a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And Ed O'Neill is actually, uh, he's a fellow Midwesterner, just like us, me yeah. and Matt, we're both, we're both from Ohio. Ohio, and, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I went to Bowling Green and uh, in Bowling Green, Ohio. One, one of my professors, i never forget, he said that Midwesterners have a reputation of when they move out to West, they're known as workhorses. They, uh, and I, I don't know if, if you've ever heard of that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I think that's true, yeah. Yeah, the people I hung out with in L.A. were mostly from, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and uh, yeah, just workaday actors and uh, or writers, uh, stand up, whatever. Um, very few of them, you, none of them, you could call stars, but they all, you know, made a living, you know, for the most part out there. Yeah. Wow. So w when you first moved to Los Angeles, you you came across more Midwesterners like yourself, more so than actual like people from the West Coast. Well, I, you know, I had a group of friends, you know, I lived in Minneapolis and worked in Minneapolis for a while. And there was a, you know, contingent of actors that kind of moved out, uh, you know, in the, in the, well, early eighties. And uh, uh, so I, you know, just hooked back up with them and we just, we'd do shows together and, uh, and, uh, you know, just hang out. So, uh, you know, we had things in common. So, uh, yeah. Now, were these people that you aligned yourself with before your move to California? Did you have like your own crew? Yeah. The, I mean, people that I knew from Minneapolis who also moved out to LA, you know, once we were out there, we'd, we'd get together. Yeah. Uh, do you care to share who they are? We might know who they are. Oh, some name. Well, people that you might recognize. Um, um, Miley Flanagan. She was the voice of. She did a lot of voice work. She did the voice of Naruto. Am I pronouncing that right? Naruto. Yeah. Oh, wow. Naruto, and uh, you know, you know the name Edie McClurg. Edie McClurg, from. Uh, she's the uh, lady from. Uh, she was in a lot of TGIF stuff. I. She. She's that lady. Yeah, you know, she's the, yeah. <laughs> okay. she, she, she's she's one of those. Yeah, he was the secretary in um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh well, he's very popular, Ed. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebies, dickheads. They all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. Oh, okay. You know, whenever whenever she comes on, you think you think, oh, good, this is going to be funny. You know. Well, Miley Flanagan is like that, too. If you'd see her, you'd recognize, oh, yeah, I've seen her in commercials here and there. And uh, anyway, yeah, so she's she's had a lot of success. Um, That's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Um, Going from the Midwest, were you, how long did it take you to, like, once you were out of college and ready to move out here? Like, how long did it take, out of curiosity? Well, quite a while. I graduated in 76, and then... A uh, brief stint in New York for six months. Didn't like New York at all. I didn't get any work and moved back to the Midwest. Uh, lived in Minneapolis for a, a while and then got a job with a theater in Iowa. In Garrison, Iowa, a town of 300 people, but there was a professional theater there, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, in an old creamery called the Old Creamery Theater. And... Uh, so we did shows there on stage, but then in the winter, we toured the state of Iowa. And uh, so that lasted a year. And then I went back to my hometown. My dad died. So I was trying to help things out back in, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And I started a dinner theater there, which uh, just closed like, I don't know, three years ago. It had a long run. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, but I just stayed with that for about a year and a half. And uh and uh, ran into some people that I knew from Minneapolis. And the, one of the guys was a producer of uh, at the Mixed Blood Theater, if you've ever heard of it. It has a, it has a national reputation amongst regional theaters. And uh, he offered me a part and then he offered me another part. So then I moved to Minneapolis, stayed there for like, you know, five years in the early 80s. And then branched out to New York and over to L.A. Did I get off? I, sometimes I can grandpa Simpson things. And, <laughs> no, it's okay. I get it. Get away from so the you, center, but you had yeah, it, it, it took me a while. It wasn't until 86, uh, 87 that I moved to LA. 
I mean, it's a it's a big difference. As somebody who came out, I came out here too early. You know, I came, I wasn't ready. I didn't have enough experience. Yeah. But I came out here because I had a, a place to stay, basically. Yeah. And, uh, as somebody from a small town, it's definitely culture shock. I I moved around a lot. I wasn't necessarily that wasn't the thing that was uh, hard, but it, just adjusting to this place. You know, I yeah. I don't even know what it was like in the early '80s. I can only imagine. Uh, you know, what it, Hollywood must have been, I mean, obviously it was way different back then. So, you know, it's, it's cool that to me, it's, it's the same experience though. Cause I did the same thing you did. I, I knew a bunch of people out here from the Midwest, from Ohio. And yeah. those are, those were my guys, you know, when I first came out here. So I think a lot of people have that same story. College friends mostly. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Main, but my best buddy from college, he moved out here. Another guy I knew there and they had a, an apartment in Hollywood. Yeah. Right in the middle. That's of how I started. Yeah. yeah on and, uh, on yeah. actually like right a block away from Santa Monica and Highland. If you know yeah. where that is, it's not a great place oh, or at least it yeah. used to not be. Um, but yeah, it was a free place to stay. And I just gotten out of film school. So it was like, it was almost one of those things where if it all worked out perfectly, it was one of those, you know, hopefully a, a cool story to tell your your kids type things but it didn't work out that well I, there was a little bit of a bumpiness but yeah. yeah definitely for midwest it's it's amazing to hear people from the midwest especially somebody like you that's been so successful um was your was it all because you came from the stage was it always a to get on tv did you just want to continue acting in whatever way you could well, no, I had I had no plan, and I was doing fine in New York. Met my wife out there in New York, and I auditioned for a play while I was in New York that was being done at the La Jolla Playhouse. So I got cast, and so we said, "Well, what the hell? We'll you know spend the summer in La Jolla. Can't beat that." Yeah. And and an agent came, saw the show, and. Uh, Said, hey, you know, want to stick around in L.A. He had an office back in New York as well, but uh, we decided to give L.A. a try and uh, stayed there for you know, twenty one years. So, and it that couldn't have been easy. It actually was. <laughs> really? To be honest, you know, I mean, there was a good agent, good mid level agent. They got me some auditions, and I. I booked him, you know, fairly regularly, and uh, I was surprised at how easy it was. Actually, I, um, yeah, there was some ups and downs, but for the most part, it was just steady, steady, you know, a, a job every other month, and uh, it was, it was, it was cool. Yeah, and like I, I feel like a part of that, or a big part of that, is you being from the Midwest because it's you know, traditionally known as a working class, blue collar, put your nose down, show up with your lunchbox and, you know, let's go to work, let's clock in. You know, my my family is, yep. uh, you know, factory driven, you know, uh, she works at Jeep, he works at Ford, uh, they work at GM. And, um, you know, I, I, I like to think you approach your career like Mr. Dewey came into the classroom on this one episode where he says, hello, I'm Mr. Dewey. How was your summer? Mine stunk. Let's get to class. And, you know, you just went straight to it. And I, I like to think Pat, Patrick Thomas O'Brien, that's how he went to these gigs. It's like, OK, Mary with children. Oh, that's work. Clock in uh, home improvement. All right. That's that's Thursday. We've got to do it. Let's clock in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you're right. That that's that's what they're looking for in LA. The casting directors they want that Midwestern vibe, um, the all American kind of uh, 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 approach to life. Yeah, and and you have that. Like, I mean, as we all know at this point, you know, these casting directors they're looking for uh, certain prototypes. Um, this guy, we, we need yep. a certain, we need a dad or we need this yep. next door neighbor type, or we need a, a professor and you like, you apply to all of those things. Yeah. Like, okay. Like, okay, man, he looks like he, he teachers, looks like he, priests and guys in lab coats was always the thing. What, what was that? Teachers, priests and guys in lab coats. There you <laughs> go. Okay. You guys remember the name Wally Cox? That sounds so familiar. Why does that sound familiar? He was he was an actor mostly back in the fifties and sixties. Look him up. 
Um, he was Mr. Peepers. He had his own show, and it was called, I think it was called Mr. Peepers. Uh, but, uh, but we're like, uh, you know, doppelgangers. And whenever I'd get a call from a casting director saying, well, they're looking for a Mr. Dewey type. I mean, they're looking for a Wally Cox type. Cha-ching, you know, almost every I walk in and they, and they, holy shit, it's, 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 you know, his brother, it's, it's Wally Cox's brother, you know, or something, but uh, you look the part look it every time, but then, yeah, that gravy train lasted for quite a while, but then I got a call from this agent. She was young and she said, they're looking for a Wally Cox type, whoever that is. <laughs> so I knew there's going to be an end to, uh, to the, <laughs> To that run, and uh, obviously you guys, yeah, you you, know, Patrick, you, you now yeah. are the Wally Cox yeah. type. They want the Patrick O'Brien type now, so yeah. you become the prototype. And yeah, the, I look. There's this up, thing. Wally there's, Cox is your brother. I think you either time traveled or you have a somebody that, that a doppelganger from back in the yeah. day. There's this thing Detroit. about that. So we're looking for a Wally Cox type, or. Uh, no, first it's get me Wally Cox, and then it's we're looking for a Wally Cox type, and then yeah, there, there's a whole progression of 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 a person's notoriety going downhill or something. Uh, I can't remember the exact. I'm sorry, I should have. Well, well, my question to you is, you know, you you became a somebody who had the, you know, you through experience, I'm sure you just went in. It was a job, but at any point, you know. I'm looking at your resume now and just the early eighties, obviously you were getting started and like late eighties, you were on these big, t like Jake and the fat man, these shows that were big. Were there ever times in your career when you got on a show or you got a job where you were like, wow, like I'm, I got this job. Like you actually got nervous because of whatever the show was that you were going to be on, or maybe you were working with well, an actor. Of course. I mean, those, those early jobs, especially. Yeah. I mean, yeah. whenever I'd get booked on something, I'd think, holy shit, you know, I'm, this is, <laughs> this is, I had low expectations. I really did of, you know, going back to college years and all that, I never thought I would be a, a working actor. I always had, you know, a, a strictly a working actor. I always had a part-time job in my head. I thought it would just be a, a hobby for me, you know, instead of a vocation but uh but no those those early jobs each time everyone came along yeah i was well being thinking, on oh, a network yeah, television is, a big time. Is, is an immense thing you know network like sets <clears throat> if you've never been on one or you just haven't like i can't even imagine i've been on very small sets i never worked on a big tv show or anything but even a small set it can be intimidating i'm not an actor i was always terrified of acting when I went to film school and like even when I was out here we had uh, somebody I worked with that he was the actor he knew all about that because I could never put myself in that place so your job is terrifying to me first off so salute to you to being able to do that and just walking on a set at all and being able to deliver uh, the way that you do but yeah I well that's scary you're on stage by the way um uh <laughs> Yeah, exactly. on stage opening night is a lot worse than going on a, in a you know sound studio because you know you've got if you screw up well, all right take two you know and uh, so the pressure isn't nearly as bad as stage work so I think having that background makes it a lot easier a lot easier yeah because okay. it definitely didn't show like we did I didn't notice any jitters in any of the the <laughs> characters you played you always seem calm. Um, yeah, I mean, and I get it. It's TV, but um, you've been in some bangers. Yeah. 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 The, the shows that we could list off, I mean, you've been in such classic 90s uh, TV and uh, just things that I remember, even like small mo or small shows like Parker Lewis Can't Lose, stuff like that. It's like, if I can't imagine if I would have met you around that, like to me, you would have been as famous as like, walking around and people noticing you all the time because you were on i mean we could go through it but it, it really like didn't you know people didn't notice me that it's crazy often. No, it, it, it didn't happen it wasn't until stay by the bell and a few mm -hmm. years after stay by, by the bell had been running that i was getting we lived on the same block we lived in burbank on the same block as a junior high and uh 
and after a while, you know, these people, because they, I'd be working out in the yard, you know, stuff. And, and after a while, these kids would you know, start looking at me. And then one kid knocked on the door one day and asked if I was, you know, Mr. Dewey. I said, yeah. And so oh, okay, cool. well. <laughs> then after that, you know, the word spread. So these kids would, you know, knock on my door quite often. But no, it wasn't until then that, uh, wow. that I would get recognized. But. Well, I mean, at what point did you just, I mean, your agent must have just been in heaven. As soon as it seems like 1990 started, you were, you acted constantly. You know, I knew actors out here that would have dreamed to get a show at all. And it just yeah. seemed like, you know, as it almost as soon as 1990 hit, I just, I don't know how much you remember of any of these, but it just, you've been the guy on all these shows and to at what point where did you ever have to like wait on work you know where is it ever that well, because it seems like yeah. you're working constantly no it, it's a constant thing out there you know there's ups and downs yeah i mean you look at the credits and there's usually what three or four per year yeah well there's more than that in the early 90s but yeah around well, yeah yeah early 90s but then yeah i mean so yeah, there's months at a time where you're just waiting for the phone to ring. So uh, yeah. but throughout the '90s, I like I noticed that you were doing more movies. Uh, you were you were still constant in in television, but you were doing film. Uh, you were in Stuart Little. Uh, you were yeah. in at the same time you were in uh, Seventh Heaven with Sliders. Uh, all of these were in '99. Darman Greg, Me and Will. Um, so and you were in Pleasantville. So. I mean, I, I think the, the wait can be a little longer when you start doing films. Am I right? Well. I guess it depends on the circumstance. I don't know. It, it all seemed pretty, pretty regular, though. I mean, TV was mm -hmm. fairly regular and film right. was really on commercial work. There was quite a bit of commercial work, too, that, that I slipped I do in recall there. you in commercials. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, what were the sponsors? Because you you were a common fixture all throughout my childhood. <laughs> I, I, I worked with some big names in, in commercials, too. I did a spot yeah. with Tiger Woods and uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. A lot of sports figures, actually. Oh, wow. John yeah. Stockton. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I know American Express, you know, you know. Nice. And I, I wanted to ask you a couple things, uh, Patrick. I've been looking up just like stories about you. And one thing I was just interested in, you know, you were always, you're this character actor and you're, you're never like the star of the show or whatever. But I did look up this really cool fact about you that at one point you were doing, uh, I think it was some sort of stage like theater production. Oh, and Tom okay. Hanks so, was your understudy at this point? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, have, I, I lost the last couple of my, I, I had glitched here or something. Oh, it's okay. Last, so last I was saying, um, I I was looking up uh, just some cool stories about your career and uh, you know, you've been this fixture as sort of a character actor in TV shows and not necessarily the main guy in uh, the shows that you're on, but I was seeing- uh, Definitely was, not the main guy. Yeah, uh, I never got the girl, you know? <laughs> did you, well, I have another question about that, but uh, I read that you actually had Tom Hanks as an understudy at a- Well, sort theater. of, okay. At one point. I did like- I did like six plays with this operation called Shakespeare Festival LA. And his wife was on the board of directors. So every spring they'd get, uh, you know, they'd contact Tom's agent or her agent and they'd get these stars to, uh, to, to do a benefit reading of Shakespeare, read some Shakespeare and collect money. But one year I was doing um, the show of Merry Wives of Windsor and my mother was sick back in Wisconsin. And so I told the producer, I said, hey, you know, she's near death, um, um, you know, possibly um, um, I might have to leave. And they didn't really have understudies for the play. And he said, well, just so happens um, Tom Hanks is in between movies. And he always said that he'd want to do a play if he could go on with with a big costume or like an old man or something where he was not recognized. And Tom Hanks had done a lot of Shakespeare in his day. He started off in Cleveland at the Cleveland Playhouse. Oh, wow. I mean, no, at uh, uh, Great Lakes Shakespeare Festival in uh, 
also in Cleveland, I think. Yeah. Um, anyway, and uh, the producer said, uh, yeah, I mean, he's always said, if you, you know, if you need someone to step in or something, let me know, because he had, you know, this knowledge and basis of Shakespeare. And the role was the old guy in Merry Wives of Windsor. And, and the producer said, well, Tom says you'll start looking at the lines. If you have to leave, he can go on. So in a sense, yes. There you and, go. My, 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 my mother recovered, so he never had to go on. But it would have been cool if he had, <laughs> in, in a way. You still got the story, though. And that, good news yeah. Recovered, yeah. But I, I read that, and I was like, wow, what a crazy uh, thing to have in your career, you know, especially your career. Um, and as somebody who kind of... Hell of a nice guy, too, Tom Hanks. That? Tom Hanks? He looks, His he reputation like is him. very accurate, just the nicest guy and down to earth, you know, as you'd ever want to meet. Nice. Um. I mean, I, 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 he puts out nothing but that. I, I'm glad to hear that. Who he is, yeah, yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you is somebody who sort of you've had a career through a lot of different, you know, stages of Hollywood, and you've been in, you know, stage, TV, movies. Um, what do you think about like the state of? I guess TV and movies in general. I mean, everything, right? Even stage, obviously, right now. But like with streaming and with, do you think it's the same thing? Do you enjoy it as much? Uh, is it the same for you? Because um, you are still a working actor. Uh, do you yeah, see but of those differences. It's it's different. You know, I left right before. Um, well, well before actually street. Well, yeah, right before streaming started. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it's like in LA, except for you know that the, the little thing I did for the for the reboot of Say by the Bell. I don't yeah, know yeah. what life is like in LA. You know, the business like in LA. I think the only thing different that I've noticed in my life about streaming, or yeah, I guess it's streaming, um, is that you know, when I was a kid. I had. I had there were six kids and my parents and we'd watch TV in this small den where you could barely fit six, you know, eight people in there. Um, but we'd all watch the same thing. And now with me and my wife and my kid, you know, if we're watching something, it's all on a laptop and we watch it individually. You know, yeah. we don't watch it collectively anymore, which is kind of too bad. Um, um, it does take along the same line, along things. the same lines. I think this guy, uh, he was a Saved by the Bell fan, and he was explaining to me that Saved by the Bell was the last TV show that was really shared by a whole generation. I mean, everybody from your generation watched Saved by the Bell, Very and it was nice. such a success that you know, right after that, Nickelodeon had their shows, and Disney had their shows, and yeah. cable, you know fragmented the market so much that that was according to this guy anyway that was the last show that was actually shared by a whole generation of kids kind of interesting but uh, yeah. streaming has really i assume changed that aspect even more than cable did well i think as an actor it individual. gives you more opportunity you know there's a lot yeah. of out there to be on yeah. as an actor but there that also it, the visibility of something you're in gets a little bit diminished because there is so many options you know a lot of these things yeah. you know just you, you, they're out there you just would never know where to look for them you know yeah yeah it's not the same as uh when saved by the bell was on you know you had to be in front of that television unless you vcr you had a vcr and you were willing to record that yeah. episode and uh for us 80s babies 90s kids the experience was waking up getting saturday morning cartoons which is now also obsolete and then that, right after that it would be saved by the bell followed by uh was it nba inside stuff yeah uh, and that was the experience and nba by, that? nba that stuff yeah yeah, it was a yeah, show with Ahmad um, Rashad. It was basically like a clip show of NBA, um, just NBA like clips and everything. And it was just like a, a clip show, basically. Isn't that what it was, Steve? Yeah, and they would do candid interviews with different uh, different basketball players. 
And, you know, but Saved by the Bell, it spoke to our generation. And I think it, it had us believing that that was going to be our experience in high school. Yeah. Like we, we were going to have these laid back teachers that would just allow us to get away with these hijinks. And, you know, everybody, all the guys that I knew grew up wanting to be A.C. Slater or Zach Morris. And ultimately, from my experience, I was more of an A.C. Screech because I was an athlete, but I never got laid. But, uh, you know, that's, that's beside the point. Um, but, man, uh, AC I, I, will, screech. I, like it. I was an AC screech. And, I like it. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I, out of all the teachers, and I'm not blowing smoke, out of all the teachers, Mr. Dewey was my favorite because he was training for American Gladiators and he knew some Tai Chi. Ha! <laughs> Pumped a little iron on the side, too. I believe there was a line about that. He huh? pumped a little iron on the side. Yeah, man. You know, he was doing double duty. You know, he, he's teaching algebra. But at the same time, he had to come back and do detention. Yeah. And he was the Go vice ahead. principal, I think, also mentioned in one episode something. But uh, but that never went anywhere in the in the series. But. When did you realize, because obviously when you were first on that show, I don't think it was like a huge, I mean, I, I can't remember, but I don't know if it was like widely a huge success at that point. Oh, interesting story about that. It wasn't. I mean, yeah. that first season was not, they got terrible reviews for the most part, and the viewership wasn't that great. But uh, the president of NBC at the time, Brandon Tartikoff, name familiar? R.I.P. Man, yeah, right. he's he's the guy that right. saved NBC. Yeah, he he, he had, came he had in. Know -how. And he turned it. Yeah. He turned it right around. Well, he had, and Saved by the Bell was one of his, you know, one of his brainchild. He the, well, anyway, he and he had two daughters, two young daughters, like I don't know, seven or eight at the time, nine, and uh, and uh, they loved the show, and. I remember I was on this episode when they, you know, it was a later episode. It was after the first season and I was on the episode and, 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 and the producer, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, blanking on his name, but got together with Brandon Tartikoff and took the main cast aside and said, we got picked up and everybody was just, you know, in, you know, just enthralled that they got picked up. They were surprised. They didn't think they were going to get another season. But they did because of Brandon Tartikoff's kids who loved the show. And, and they used to come on the set and just love to hang out with the kids. And, and, and Tartikoff thought, well, if my kids love it so much and their friends love it so much, it's going to spread. And, he, and it was his decision then to, to, to keep it going. It was a big surprise when uh, they got that second season. Smart man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Intelligent man. Yeah, I wonder how many tragic, shows we tragic, lost where here. that didn't happen. You know, how many good shows that just got clipped because they weren't, you know, critically acclaimed or whatever, but nobody had, yeah. the, you know, gumption to keep them going. Yeah. Tragic ha thing happened though. He was driving, I think it was in Texas, got in this bad car accident. And one of the daughters had this really pretty serious uh, brain damage. And I guess wow. Tartikoff, you know, kind of gave up the biz and was spending so much time with this special, I guess the specialist was in Texas uh, for the brain damage, uh, the doctor specialist uh, tending to his, his daughter that uh, he, yeah, he kind of um, got out of show business, I guess. Well, you know, it, it took a while. He just gradually less and less was involved with, uh, with his job and he died at a pretty young age too. That's unfortunate because he, he's one of the greatest uh, television minds uh, that yep. I, you know, I'm, I'm a television nerd, uh, self-admitted, and he kind of single-handedly saved NBC, the network itself, he they did. said, you know, the, 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 all of the shows at the time were tanking. Uh, they, they were just one-off shows that would last for a season. And, you know, he was the guy that was there when the Cosby show came to fruition and uh, you know he was like let's bring back the family sitcom because at the time you know uh, you know tv was starting to get too wacky you know um just these convoluted ideas he's like let's let's bring back the essence of like bringing people in front of their televisions in their living room 
and you know the Cosby show came to fruition uh SNL was on the brink of getting canceled and he was the guy that was there to like keep it afloat until Lauren got there and it's like okay we're, we're, we're safe again um now I I remember him mostly from the uh No Hope With Dope episode on Saved by the Bell yeah where he get, yeah. he guest starred as himself um, yeah yeah he was he was the biggest name in Hollywood at the time he really was and hell of a nice guy too also you know self-effacing uh just a just a nice guy but I don't know if he was from the Midwest or not, but he had that kind of vibe to him. He had that vibe. Oh, I'm glad you said that. So living in Los Angeles, you you could pick up those vibes without some people even telling you they're from the Midwest. Well, half the time it's just the accent, you know. <laughs> uh, that Wisconsin, Minnesota accent can stick out, but... Uh, yeah. But I don't... You, you know, I, I, I feel That's like cool. it is obvious, though. Pay attention. I, from my personal experience, you can tell the more down to earth people. It's like, okay, they're probably from the Midwest. Yeah. A few people out here, <laughs> maybe not yeah. at a big dose of reality, you know, but. Yeah. As um, some like, be, we keep. Yeah, I have the about... story. One more. One more about Brandon Tartikoff. Okay. So he was doing the, these friends of his wrote this pilot. It was called Smell the Roses. And it was the first show about a nerd family. So uh, I go in to the, to the, I got, you know, went to the regular casting session, then you get called back. Went into the call back and it was weirdly on a weekend. And it was uh, up in this place, you usually don't go to auditions. I remember walking into NBC, you take the elevator up. I was wondering where I was going. <clears throat> and I got down to the room number and it was, Brandon Tartikoff's fucking office. <laughs> and he's in there with two of, with, with his friends, you know, the, the writers from the show. And they're watching, it was a playoff game, I think, of a football game. And so I peek in there and, you know, and I, oh, shit, Brandon Tartikoff's in there. And I was, you know, just kind of hanging out. And I was early, you know, nobody else was there for the audition, just hanging out in the hallway. And Tartikoff, you know, comes out and he sees me there and he says, Pat, he knew my fucking name, you know? And Come on in, have a beer. Sure. <laughs> so I go into the office and I'm watching the football game and cracked open a beer and waited for the other people to, uh, you know, the other auditioners to come in. And uh, yeah, it was just, he was just so down. And, and so were his friends, very down to earth guys. And uh, the show never got, I got cast in it, but the show never got picked up. So Man, what an yeah. opportunity, though. You open up the elevator yeah. doors open and the guy, the main guy is right there. What a great yeah. opportunity as an actor. I yeah. just saw he's from Freeport, New York. Okay. You know. Freeport. R.I.P. R.I.P. to that man. I think that's... Yeah. I'm not sure, but I think that might be out on Long Island. But uh, anyway. Hmm. Yeah. Well, guys i don't want to cut us off but we only got about a minute and a half left on this session so do we want to wrap it up do we want to keep going just get off this session real quick and continue recording on another one so we don't run out of time patrick it's, how do you feel you yeah, got 20 it, more minutes yeah, I'm, you? I'm cool but yeah do whatever you need to do is uh you know well let me uh we're gonna end this one and to be continued we'll be right back <laughs> There's something about it. It's great. It's just different. Giant Dr. Pepper is like nothing else. Patrick, one thing I wanted to ask, we keep talking about, you know, the regularity, all these things that we've seen you in. Was there ever a time where you did not enjoy the work, or the acting? Was it ever uh, something you weren't into? Is that what maybe why you left LA or was it just something different? No, I, I always enjoyed acting. And when my our plan, when we moved back to Minneapolis was that I would continue working in theater. Cause you know, when I was here in the eighties, I worked pretty much constantly just on stage. 
and I missed stage work. You know, once in a while I do plays in LA, but uh, not that often. And I mean, like I was saying earlier, the stage is really more exciting, you know, and you get to know the people and you get to, you know, build up friendships and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's just a more fulfilling process, I think. Money ain't so good, but uh, I, you know, sold our house in L.A. for plenty to buy a house here in Minneapolis, or you know, very comfortable financially, so that was no problem. But uh, didn't quite turn out that way. Uh, the theater that I always worked at had kind of changed their focus, their their mission. So um, uh, there weren't that many parts for me. But uh, what was the question again? Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. just about just about acting in general. But that actually, you talking about stage? I, I wanted to ask you a couple of things because I did see you worked with some, quite a few big names, like actors, like Hollywood people. Did you ever work with like Kelsey Grammer? I saw that you might have worked with him on stage. Uh, yeah, well, that was for one of those um, interesting stories about Kelsey Grammer. I can't tell it though. Uh, 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 you can he, if you want. <laughs> it's bad. You can. Uh, yeah. 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 We don't want to put you in that place. Too bad. It's a good story, too. <laughs> but uh, uh, so the, the, remember Shakespeare Festival LA, I'm telling you about those uh, benefit readings that, that we were doing. He did two of them. And um, all right, I'll tell just a small part of, of the story. Uh, we were doing Taming of the Shrew and Petruchio. I mean, it's a great part. And uh, he had a theatrical background as well, uh, strong uh, in Shakespeare. Um, and well, he came in, shall we say, unprepared to do it. And uh, he left for a while and came back in very prepared and, and everyone you know during we would rehearse in the afternoon and and then and then come back and perform it for the audience in the evening and so during rehearsals you know he was hung over or something more i don't know um and everyone is concerned you know because can he can he do this you know i mean and then he disappeared during the lunch during the dinner break and everyone is worried holy shit, where's kelsey and then he came back in did a 180, not sure what he did, but he went on and he performed the best Shakespeare I have ever heard. It was just <laughs> so, uh, oh, he got yeah, it. but that was, but it, again, it was just, you know, a reading. So he had the script, but he knew it. It, it. it seemed like he had done the role before, you know, but it was, he's really, he was really good. Frazier Crane. <laughs> but. Frazier Crane. He's a person. I auditioned for that show. show so many times, but I never got cast. Really? Wow. Frazier, yeah. What that, about that? Were there any shows you wanted to be on? You were just like, I, there was never an opportunity. Can you remember any well, like that? that? That and the New Heart show, which I oh, love. Oh, okay. And I never I it, go on to that one. I must have auditioned half a dozen times for that, and but never cast. But I did get to work with Bob once on a commercial. But really, yeah. what was that yeah. like? <laughs> well, there's a story there too. <laughs> now that I think of it, so it was for this series called. Uh, it was for Stamps.com, and it was a series of commercials. A campaign it was really well written, and Bob was the Melman Melman Industries. He was this. Uh, uh, he ran a company that would just put out shitty projects products you know like the electric umbrella you know the do-it-yourself surgery home kit or something it's ringing a kit. bell yeah i think i do it remember was, it was popular it's yeah. still on you can look up those commercials it's still on yeah. you know youtubes of them so now uh, we've we've solved the explosion problem with, with this product no well, that, uh, what did we do change the color uh, that's a start don't touch that. Well, anyway, the 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 director of it was this guy named uh, uh, Pitka, Joe Pitka. He was the biggest name in commercials at, at about that time in L.A., but he was an asshole. I, I, and I can t I can say this. He would <laughs> he would put down actors all the time on stage. You go into auditions for a Pitka commercial 
and all the actors that tell their horror stories about working with this guy. Wow. But again, the biggest name in commercials, and he was a guy that produced and directed um, um, the NBA cartoon thing. Uh, oh, Space Jam? Yeah, yeah. That was his project. He loved, he loved the NBA. He loved basketball. Hmm. Um, in fact, he was the guy who directed that, uh, that uh, um, commercial I did with Tiger Woods. Anyway, where am I going with this story? Um, so uh, Pitka, yeah, uh, he was the director of this. And, and it was this big production. And I was a guy in a lab coat, you know, just a background kind of guy. And, and I'm called to the set. And he says, okay, O'Brien, you know your lines? And I said, what lines? I was never given any lines. I was just, I thought I was just background or something, you know? And he said, no, you got lines and uh, do them. And, and, and so then he cut to, he had to talk to somebody else, the director and said to and Newhart standing right next to me, he said, I was never given any lines. What the hell? What, what? And <laughs> Newhart says, I say this, you say this, I say this, and then you react to this. I said, okay. <laughs> and then we're back to him. And then, and then Pitka says, okay, O'Brien, all right, action, black light, you know, action. And I, I stumbled through the first one and I screwed it up again, you know, for the first time. And Pitka's yelling, I thought you were a professional, O'Brien. What the hell? And he's giving me this shit, you know. God. And Man, I know. That's and, not uh, good. I had been around long enough, so and I knew of this guy's antics, but also, the word got on the set that Pitka, because Bob was there, he was on his best behavior. So mm. I thought that maybe he, he was just, you know, goofing with me a little bit. But then I did it the next take and it went fine. And uh, but Bob was he, he was great. You know, he just kind of said, don't worry, he's a dickhead. But uh, you know, I got your back, basically. <laughs> Bob's, and Bob's got Paul. Got, Bob, Bob's got what? Bob's got pull. Yeah, yeah, big, big yeah. pull. Yeah. And he's a fellow Midwesterner from, from Chicago. Yeah. 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 Um, we're seeing a thread here, guys. A lot of good Midwesterners in Hollywood. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, straight from the lakes, man. We're yeah. great Lakers. <laughs> hey, I might be back in Cleveland doing a, a one man show coming up in July. Hey, Cleveland, you hear Yo. that? All of our friends, go see Pat O'Brien in Cleveland. Pat, yeah, Steve, we'll you're still back in? Show. You can Steve. hype it up. Steve, you're still living in Ohio? No, I'm in Atlanta. Matt's in Los Angeles. Oh, oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Atlanta, okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I did a trek from Ohio to Texas. I, I was in Texas for 12 years, moved back to Ohio for a year, and then, and then uh, down to Atlanta just last a lot of work. year. A lot of work in Atlanta now, I hear, too. Yeah. Film work, yeah. TV and film. That, that's what it seems like. Um, it, it's been expanding. And, you know, a, a lot of the, the residents, the, the native ATLians, they complain about, you know, being full and just traffic. And it's like, I mean, this is taking the bad with the good. I mean, Atlanta, I feel, is the newest city to join this party with Los Angeles and New York. And New Yorkers and Los Angeles people, they don't complain. They're used to it. You know, yeah. that that's 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 a part of living in a a, a populous industrious city and it, it's still growing. More industry is coming here uh, with Tyler. And you Perry. went blue. What's that? You went blue too. Yeah. Hey, and Georgia. that too. So, so it's like, you know, you gotta give some credit to these transplants, you know. Um as as much as the, the natives hate it, but hey, you, you didn't do that before. It, it wasn't until what, Carter? Yeah, oh, yeah, that was the last oh time. God. And he's from here, so that's... And Atlanta is, you know, a very liberal city, yeah? Pretty yeah. much all big cities are very liberal, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah you know... Of... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, we wanted to talk about uh, your experience at, at Eau Claire, uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and there was a turning of the tides uh, with liberal arts of sorts. Um, were you a part of that? Uh, I wasn't all that, you know, I wasn't conscious of, well, of course, I mean, all society was, you know, in turmoil back in the late 60s, early 70s with Vietnam and everything. But uh, right. I mean, I, 
didn't notice the change. I think the change had, had you know started before I got there in, in 1970, end of, yeah, 1970, actually. But oddly enough, I mean, yeah, I was against the war, and uh, but my solution was not to go to Canada or whatever, but, you know, the lottery, I don't know if you remember, there was this draft lottery, yeah. and my number came up six, so I'm going. So I quickly joined the National Guard and uh, got in, um, which pretty much back then uh, assured you of not going to Vietnam. You could be sent to Germany, maybe, but you wouldn't be sent to Nam. So I was in the National Guard while I was going to school all those six years. Uh, you had to stay in the National Guard for six years. So I had to stay in Eau Claire for that time. So I just took my time going to school. It took me six years to get through. Um, five and a half. But uh, so, yeah, so I was kind of, you know, straddling the National Guard and having to, you know, couldn't grow my hair long, couldn't grow a beard or anything like that. Uh, uh, but also, um, you know, being within the arts and, you know, extremely liberal and extremely anti-Vietnam. So it was uh, kind of, I had an interesting perspective, perspective because, you know, a lot of the other guys in the National Guard, especially the older guys, maybe who had been in the regular army for quite a while uh, and now doing National Guard, they were pretty much gung-ho, you know, Vietnam, uh, 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 you know, being in favor of it. So, uh, but I don't know if that really affected me getting more into the theater or into the arts because I was into it, you know, ever since I, I was a kid, I wanted to do the, again, I never thought that I'd be doing it professionally, but I always thought that I'd be, you know, at least doing it as a hobby, you know, ever since I was, you know, I went to Catholic school and uh, once I had the opportunity to be an altar boy, man, I was in there because it's, it's theater. You got costumes and props and blocking and lines, and you got the star of the show and the priest. You got an audience. You got the almighty reviewer up above. I mean, you got everything. Um, so I was just, I, I just loved doing that. So, and, oh. and then just continued on, you know, the, the few opportunities that I had in this Catholic school to do theater. You couldn't do any theater until you were a junior. So, but once I did, I, once I could, I, you know, got into any of the shows that I could. Uh, uh, but, so so uh, it was your experience as an altar boy that was more of an influence. What, did you have a favorite actor or actress or um, were, were, were there any performers that inspired you? Not really. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't into TV that much. Um, wow. uh, like I said, you know, watching TV, you know, <laughs> with eight other people it was kind of and I was kind of a loner anyway I'd rather go off and read or something but I mean there's a lot of friends of mine I mean they know every episode of, of Twilight Zone or 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 or, or uh, uh, Bonanza or you know what's his name uh Hitchcock you know yeah yeah and, and but I I wasn't like that so I didn't I mean I watch TV of course and you know favorite actors yeah like but Barney Fife was you know, hilarious and uh, Don Knotts. Don Knotts. <laughs> Good old Don. Well, I got Knotts. to work with in, in Pleasantville. Oh wow! Oh, that's yeah. awesome. I actually didn't work with him. I didn't have any scenes with him. But at the at the at the party at the on the you know the, the screening, the first screening, he was there, and I I sidled up to him and tried to tell him, "Yeah, man, God, you were you know, I'm I'm a nerd type like you, and you were." <laughs> patterned a lot of my humor after you and tried to talk him up but he was pretty frail by then he was pretty old and he just it's didn't seem that interested in carrying on a conversation so it didn't go anywhere but uh, it, it, it was one of those cases where you, you kind of don't want to meet your idols in a way I mean in his case he wasn't really a prick it was just like it, it, it had to be some level of disheartening um seeing your somebody that you look up to and uh, look at with in reverence, you know what I mean. Um, I always just found it hard to tell. But you're right. Like, he wasn't like yeah, I want, yeah, I want to yeah emphasize it. He wasn't being a prick, but he was just really old by then. I mean, they made him look a lot younger, you know, in the in the film. You know, he comes across as being pretty vibrant, but he was yeah. he was pretty frail. He uh, yeah, he had someone there to help him. In fact, uh, an assistant oh, wow. at oh, the wow. 
at the at the screenings. So uh, yeah, so I, I wasn't blaming him for not, you know. It, one of those oh, no, it's, oh, it's hard to like talk to your, I, I've never been in a position to be like right next to an idol of mine or somebody like that. I'm even just talking to you, Pat. And honestly, I get a little nervous anyway, but to tell somebody like that kind of stuff, I, I, I can't do it. It's so hard to do that. It's, you yeah. know, to tell somebody you idolize them. So, yeah. I mean, just so cool to work with them though. That movie, I don't know. That movie to me doesn't get enough credit. I always love Pleasantville. Boom, so. boom. I love that movie. I agree hundred percent. Roy, why don't you show them what you showed me before? I popped. It's okay, Roy, come on up here. I know, Roy. <gasps> Thanks. Um, yeah, when people ask me, you know, what was, you know, what in LA, what was the thing that you were most proud of? And it's Pleasantville. That was really? a yeah. damn good movie yeah, I mean, on so many different levels too. It works, you know, it's a, it's very visual. Yeah. It's like a really, I don't know. It just, I feel like there was a movie, I think Truman show or something came out like along with it or like a, near the same Around time, that time and it got About a little more time, famed, yeah. but yeah. yeah, I love Pleasantville. I remember watching that with my family a lot, and just a classic. I'm told, I'm told that it's studied now in uh, film schools. Some of we, them. we studied that actually in in one of did our you? classes. Yeah, yeah. And we definitely like did in my cinematography class. They used it in a, like just about lighting and how to achieve different you know um, vibes and moods in film using light. So. Yeah. Yeah. Was it was it all good vibes working on that set for Pleasant Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who was the director of that? Bill Macy. Um, okay. um, uh, Ross, Gary Ross. Not a big name, but he did. Uh, well, he did that one with Tom Hanks. Uh, big was oh, one wow. of. Uh, what it was that's, right before Pleasantville, I think. That's a classic. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, um, yeah. It was a. Uh, Great experience. Um, uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, Bill Macy was real, another Midwesterner, Chicago guy, completely down to earth. You you know, hang out with him at uh, at lunch and yeah, shoot the shit. And William H Macy. Yeah. Wow, I I didn't know he was from Chicago. Yeah, he did a lot of theater in in Chicago. Yeah. Where, yeah. Actually, I'm not sure if he's from Chicago, but that's where he. Yeah, he did a lot of theater there. His roots, okay. Yeah. I, I, he's been in a lot of stuff, but the first thing that comes to mind, I'm sorry, is Little Bill from Boogie Nights. <laughs> yeah. I'm I remember sorry. he was great in that movie. Not a great he was. <laughs> Have you ever seen Boogie Nights, Patrick? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, it's a classic. It's yeah. A yeah. 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 He was good in the, the movie The Cooler, too. That's another movie I remember. That's when he was really getting, like, big in Hollywood later yeah. on in his career. I mean, he's been in a lot of stuff, so. Yeah. I, out of the different TV projects that you worked on, uh, do any of them stand out um, as far as, like, uh, you know, having the best time uh, on the set, working with yeah. some of the co-hosts or co-stars? Uh, which ones? Okay, I was a drowning victim on Baywatch, getting mouth to mouth with one of the Baywatch babes. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's you just lived both of our dreams, I think, Pat. So, Nineteen takes. Who was counting? You know. <laughs> I messed up. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Roll it Thank back, you. guys. Sorry. Sorry. You got to do this one again. My my air intake. I don't. I think it was off for a second. <laughs> You are a legend, Patrick. I don't even think you realize the <coughs> the magnitude of your star power. Like Kevin Bacon, Kevin Schmacon. We can play six degrees of Patrick Thomas O'Brien. Yes. We I swear. I mean, he's worked with Tiffany Amber Thiessen to Morgan Freeman. He's worked with the he's worked with them all. Yeah. And I mean to be honest with you, Pat, the fact you did, you were on here with us today is a dream come true. So thank you so much for giving us your time and for 
sharing these stories with us. It's it's amazing. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. It's fucking well, amazing. Gosh, I'm sorry. Gosh. I had to say it. It's fucking amazing. And, and I, I know you, you said, you know, your memories are a little fog from your Saved by the Bell days, but it, like being around that cast, do you, do you like, do you have any memories to share? Uh, like I said, I wasn't paying that much attention. Um, <laughs> I love it. You know, who would have thought that how many years later it would still be a thing, you know? Um, yeah. Um, but you want you want some dirt on the cast is what you're going for. Here. No, I don't want to. Look, hey. I, 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 hey, Tiffany, Tiffany Amber Thiessen well, yeah, is. Yeah, good things. Yeah, yeah. She, she is an angel brought here from you Earth. Got did dirt, you, Pat. You can share that too. If you got did, some dirt, did, please feel did free. You, but I, what I want to know is, did you realize you were among an angel here on Earth? Did you know at the time? <laughs> that was when he was on Baywatch, Steve. That Lark was on. actually Lark was actually my favorite. She was so Lark? sweet. Yeah, oh, she, she was, was so my sweet. favorite too. So Lark and 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 and, and Mario, they were great. Yeah. AC Slater, the international player. That that's he's yeah. the people's champ. You know, it was it was Zach, he's the proto, the protagonist, but you know, the 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 fans, they knew AC. I'm was, just concerned that guy. he hasn't aged a day in, at all since he was in the show. That's what concerns yeah. me about AC. So he's the yeah. real Benjamin Button. Yeah, he really is. And you yeah. know, he uh he yeah, you know, it's, talking, you know, I did had that scene with him on that uh on on the reboot and uh yeah he he really has not aged much although they said the same about me but uh <laughs> elizabeth was looking good too she had too much makeup on it was kind elizabeth of berkeley take down yeah. but she still looked really good so, i mean and good them. i i love them all but jesse was probably my least favorite I, i'm just going to say it and uh you Patrick, you were you were in my favorite episode of Saved by the Bell when Jesse uh, gets cracked out on the caffeine pills. But did she know? Did you know what she wanted to happen to Mr. Dewey? She wanted Mr. Dewey to get crushed in American Gladiator tryouts, all because she wasn't prepared for your test. So what, what? Yeah, it and, was and, my know, test that drove her to it. Yeah. But in, instead of just buckling down and, and doing her due diligence, she just rattles off on these pills and she gets so excited. <laughs> I mean, luckily, luckily nothing happened to you and because you're built for this. You were ready for that American Gladiators tryout. And, you would have, you, know, you, you would. I'm, well, in fact, uh, I wanted them to write a little uh, episode afterwards that I, I hook up with one of the uh, American gladiators. I thought oh, that would have been, oh, that would have been amazing. <laughs> On a very special Saved by the Bell. <laughs> Mr. Dewey and uh, Lace or whatever. They all had those one Storm. word. <laughs> yeah. Gash. Gash was her name. <laughs> what was her name? Gash. Gash. Did I say that? <laughs> Say that? PTO, PTO, PTO. I, I stole that. Okay. Here's the, here's the story. Here's the back. And, and, and Brandon Tartikoff, it goes, there was a show called Nightstand. I don't even think that's on the IMDb list, Nightstand. And it was this takeoff, a spoof on talk shows. And, and they had me on as... What what the hell is the deal? Odd odd pairings or something, you know, odd relationships. And I was a nerdy guy, but I was married, or my girlfriend or something was this American gladiators type. And her name on the show was Gash. <laughs> I thought it was funny. I didn't think they could get away with it, but they did, you know. It was <laughs> I but, am gonna uh, make. I need to but, like see what Gash that, looks like. <laughs> that that was an NBC um um production, and Brandon Tartikoff was there watching it that that episode, and that's when he was not doing well, and uh, actually had this little talk with him. Said, "How you doing, eh, eh, my daughter?" Blah blah blah, and he was not his usual self. I mean, he was just 
you could tell he was just going through the motions, but uh, he was detached. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I can't believe yeah. they had that character name on a TV show. That's insane. I mean, time and place. If you did that now, you'd be, <laughs> you'd be I know. Yeah. on yeah. charges. Yeah. Yeah, so we're you guys might get in some. Yeah, we all know. We in. please, that's one of the funniest things. I almost spit coffee out of my nose, Patrick. So please, that's yeah. hilarious. Don't worry about that. And I remember <laughs> when, 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 when we had the read through and we came to that. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> this, is it? this is it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it was this late night show. Um, I don't remember this at all. I have to look this up. Nightstand, night, nightstand. Yeah. Yeah, is it I'm trying to think of the guy who, who you know he was the talk show host. He was this funny guy. Can't think of his name, but uh, are you talking about the? Uh, he he was the dad on uh, uh, Parker Lewis can't lose. That guy. I don't know. Tim. Uh, it's his name's Dirk D Dick Dietrich. Does that sound familiar? That was the name of the character of that he played. I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That that is the dad off uh, Parker Lewis. Really? Camp. Yeah. Um. Because th this was a syndication deal, wasn't it? This was like late night. They would air. Yeah. Uh, um, late night. I remember. Yeah. yeah it, it, um. Nightstand. Oh with the yeah, Timothy Stack. Timothy I remember Stack. this guy. Okay. And yeah, you were actually in an episode of Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Um, you yeah. played Kubiak's dad. Um, but yeah, I, I I totally remember that show. Yeah. Okay. I I, yeah. I got a and I remember that actually being hilarious. Like I I think yeah. I was a teenager. You're pretty funny. Yeah. So I, I was they able had to a get character like named Gash. Things. They had my I would have watched that. I'm, believe me, I'm tuning in. So. But it was kind of hard. It wasn't successful, I don't think, because it's kind. It was kind of hard to spoof talk show hosts. I mean, talk shows because they got so outlandish and outrageous that it was hard to top yeah. you know what what they were doing on the regular talk shows so uh they were parodies within themselves yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know wow that's yeah. hilarious how did we get off on that uh, <laughs> oh, cash. it was all the way back to cash yeah cash has a lot of life so to speak uh, <laughs> Well, Patrick, I honestly, Steve, do you got anything else from Patrick? I know we uh, we don't want to keep him too long. Do you have any other questions? And it's just been a pleasure. And uh, I, I'm really going to start playing Six Degrees of Patrick Thomas O'Brien now. Um, Game, we're, I, can we get you your blessing, Patrick? We're going to create, we, we got a board game ready to go. We're going to get this going, so. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Well, I have to say it's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for doing this and, uh, you know, talking to us and maybe, you know, maybe we can do it again sometime. I would love to, you know, ask you more questions if you feel like it, but if not, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, hey I have to say that, uh, you know, I was, I feel like I don't do well in most interviews, but you guys were really cool. And, uh, this went a lot better than I expected it to. So, uh, yeah, it's been a fantastic uh, interview. Again, let me know. Uh, if you want to interview uh, the voice of Naruto, I can uh, ask her if uh, if she wants to be on. Well, hey, we we'll we'll be in touch. But as far as but this look episode, her up, she's done a lot of she's done a lot of stuff. You'd recognize her as another. Most definitely, Edie uh, McClure. Miss, she's Miss, she's cool Miss, lady. Miss Dude, she's funny. If you can get us Mrs. McClurg, she was in Tiny Toon Adventures. She is a she is one of the voice <laughs> acting goddesses. Uh, she has been knee deep in the game and like behind the scenes and in front of the screen. Like she just please. You, you, hey. you, you're talking Edie McClurg herself? Is that or yes? Oh it, yeah, Miss Miss McClurg. Yeah, I was her hey. wife. I was her husband twice in a couple <laughs> yeah. of movies. Well, yeah. this is an open invitation. Patrick, you come on anytime. Edie, please join us at some point. But I don't know about Edie, but my, I, I've, I've, I've lost touch with Edie, but Miley Flanagan, yeah. The, Miley, please. I'm sorry, Miley. Okay, Miley, well, yeah. open invitation. And uh, just, Patrick, you're a great interview, and you are a true legend of the 90s. So thank you so much. I admire your taste. Uh, man, you are a pop culture god, Patrick.
This has happened in the 90s with Steve G, Mad G, Patrick Thomas O'Brien. Uh, ah. Ah. <laughs> uh, All right. Settle down. <laughs>